Hi, I'm Scott Tullick, author of the Swithin series of Arthurian novels, the only book series that stays completely faithful to the real medieval legend of King Arthur. So let's say you, like I was, are interested in all this King Arthur stuff, and you want to get to the bottom of the real story. So you soon find Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Artour, but not long into it you discover it's not exactly the pulse-pounding thriller you've been led to expect, and actually, it's pretty darn hard to read. But fear not, because I'm going to give you some priceless tips on how to approach this work, which will really help you as you try to dig in. Before we start, we need to step back and discover what Le Mort work is and how it developed. This is crucial to just knowing what you're getting into, which will make reading it much easier. The first thing to know is that there is no one story of King Arthur. It seems that there was this guy Arthur back around the year 500, and he fought in some wars, but more importantly, all these stories started building up around him. This is what makes this a legend in the true sense of the word, because all these stories started building up around this one person. An important thing to know about Le Mort d'Artour is it's a shortened version of a bunch of different stories written at different times by different people. One person added Merlin, one person added Lancelot, Another person added the Holy Grail, but these elements were never conceived of as part of one coherent story. So the sheer amount of story grew to huge size. There was one version in the 1200s called the Vulgate and Post-Vulgate Cycle that tried to make it all into one coherent version, but that was around 3,000 pages. Le Mort d'Artour is only about 1,000 pages. So, what happened to all those stuff in all those other pages? What happened is that Sir Thomas Mallory took all those stories and brutally shortened them. Mallory was actually in prison, and what he did, maybe to pass the time, is he took all these stories and arranged them into an order he liked, and then shortened them way down, leaving out huge chunk of story in the process. So what you're reading in Le Mort d'Artour is Mallory's shortened compilation of all these different stories, making it the only existing version of the Arthurian legend by one single author. It became super popular, not least because it was one of the first releases after the invention of the printing press, but it became so famous that this is now considered the definitive version of the Arthurian legend. All right, then, knowing all that, how do you read Le Mort d'Artour? The first and most important thing is to slow down. Because Mallory shortened the story so much, huge events of massive importance are flying by thick and fast. Imagine if the plot of Star Wars were described as a farm boy gets involved in an adventure to save a princess and ends up a big hero. That's kind of what Le Mort d'Artour is like. And if you don't slow down and take the time to process it and what it all means, you won't get what's so great about it. Now this is only my opinion, although I am a guy who's been reading and studying the Arthurian legend for years now, and I am writing my own book series interpreting it, and I say that the thoughts Le Mort d'Artour inspires you to have are where the real action is. The story presents a number of different moral and existential questions in such a way it prompts you to think them through. So just one example, King Arthur accidentally sleeps with his half-sister. They have a child, and Merlin comes to him and says, Hey, you know what? This child is going to come back and be your ultimate downfall. So King Arthur has all the children born on that day killed in order to prevent this from happening. But, of course, he misses the one, and that child comes back at the end to be his ultimate downfall. So it's up to you to think, what must Arthur be thinking and feeling? What must his half-sister be thinking and feeling? How does Arthur feel when he orders all those babies to be killed? What do his knights and all his subjects think about his decision to do that? What does the boy think when he grows up and finds out that his father tried to have him killed? And what does Arthur think when he finds out his plan didn't work at all? So yeah, there's all the romance and the magic and the adventure, but to me the thoughts this book causes you to have are the true greatness of the work. If you do get into it, eventually it will blow your mind on multiple levels. And I warn you that most people who dig too far into the Arthurian legend do get completely obsessed. So now let's talk about the language. The book was written in 1485 and is in Middle English. Most editions you come across will have been translated to some degree and there should be a glossary in the back. If you can read Shakespeare easily, you should have no problem, but if you're just coming into it, I say just relax and go with it. You might not understand everything, but you'll probably get the general gist. And if you do get into it, there's some wonderfully expressive and poetic language. 
Also try to pay attention to family relationships. Understanding the family relationships of the characters in the book will add a whole new level of understanding. And I gotta tell you, these are not gonna be called out for you. So for example, Arthur's mother is also the mother of his enemy, Morgan Le Fay, making her his half-sister. His other half-sister is Margaza, who is the mother of Sir Gawain, who goes on to become King Arthur's best friend. There was a lot of very nasty drama to get Arthur born from the same mother as Margaza. So when she gives birth to a child that comes back to destroy Arthur at the end, you could view it as a kind of cosmic vengeance. Sir Lancelot is from a whole different family in Gaul, which is now France, and his whole family line and his relatives become very important as the story moves on. Especially at the very end, when Arthur and Lancelot go to war and the entire kingdom splits along these two family lines. One thing I'm trying to do in my book series is make the family relationships very clear because once you understand them, they're very, very important to the whole story. Because the stories that make up the Mordor Tour were never intended to be one cohesive story, it can be very difficult to understand when things are happening and the order they're happening in. Sometimes there's a long time period between chapters in a story that they don't tell you about. And sometimes there's things that happen that just plain don't make sense. For example, the other son, it says King Arthur has, who's dropped in there and then never mentioned again, ever. Just relax and let it wash over you. It doesn't really have any impact on the story. Another thing is that if you've only seen King Arthur movies or TV shows, this is, book is really not going to go the way you expect. It's not so much about the nobility and heroism as you might think, there's not as much romance as you might think, and none of these things come to the neat and tidy endings we're used to. For the most part, the stories don't really end. They just weave into another story or a few stories. Sometimes you break into a story to start a different story, and sometimes you go back to the main story, or sometimes you go on to a different story. Sometimes it seems like a story is over, but then it tacks on another little story at the end. Just follow where it leads. That's actually one of the great things about the Arthurian legend, is it weaves all these stories together in such a way that makes you think, why did they put these two stories together, and what does this story say about that one? And now we come to the issue of Tristram. In the middle of the book, you might find yourself asking, who is this guy Tristram? What, what's he doing here? And will he ever go away? He's Tristram, also known as Tristan, as in Tristan and Isolde, which was made into the famous opera. He was in a separate strand of Arthurian literature, and Mallory decided to wedge him right there in the middle in a way that might annoy you. Now this is bad literary advice and it might not be what your literature teacher would tell you to do and you need to understand that I am a bad person for telling you this. I am a bad person. But if you're just reading this for fun and you just want to know about King Arthur, the whole Tristram thing, you might just want to skip it. You will not face any penalty on your taxes. You will not admit foul body odor, and you might just be happier in the long run. And you know, you can always go back later. So I say just put it down at the first mention of Tristram and pick it up again in chapter 11 to continue your Arthur, Lancelot, Guinevere story already in progress. Now let's talk about the quest for the Holy Grail. Another thing I'd just like to point out is that the quest for the Holy Grail is very far out there, and I can pretty much guarantee it's not going to be what you expect. We've been left with the impression that the quest for the Holy Grail is the crowning achievement of the Arthurian world, and a big win for King Arthur. They go after it, and they get it! And then they drink from the Holy Grail, and once they do, they can shoot lasers from their eyes. So as you actually read it, you might be a little confused when, golly! It all seems like death, despair, and destruction. That's because for all these years, you heard wrong. The truth is that Arthur begs the knights not to go on the quest. Most of them learn that everything they've held dear their entire lives is wrong. In short, they don't triumph at all. They get their asses kicked. The other thing is, because this whole section comes from still another source, don't be surprised when everything about the book changes and then changes right back. It's like you're in Lord of the Rings, and suddenly you're in Game of Thrones. And all of a sudden you're back on Lord of the Rings. The whole world of the book abruptly changes for about three chapters, and then suddenly changes right back. Go with it! So ultimately then, what's so great about it? 
When you slow down and you start to think about all the resonances and the meanings, the actions and their far-reaching consequences, the whole thing becomes incredibly profound, poetic, and beautiful. So as we said, Arthur fathers this illegitimate child and tries to have him killed, only to have that child come back and try to kill him later. Lancelot is the perfect knight. Only his weakness for Guinevere keeps him from perfection and prevents him from ultimately reaching the Holy Grail. Arthur is the choice of God when he pulls the sword from the stone, but by the quest for the Holy Grail he finds out God isn't happy with him at all. Arthur prizes loyalty, but ultimately it's his own loyalty to his friend Sir Gawain that ultimately brings down his entire kingdom. The whole thing is rife with these kind of cosmic ironies and poetic resonances that gathers such force that by the end the entire theme becomes undeniably powerful. Okay, I hope all of this was beneficial and helps you make some headway into this incredible work of literature. Thanks so much for watching, and if you're interested, check out my book series, The Swithin, which tells the real medieval legend of King Arthur in a book series meant for readers of today.